This is Beck Bamberger with the latest in San Diego business news. Breast cancer may be one step closer. We interrupt our program to bring you this important message. The setting sun was unpleasantly hot on Helen's back. Her car, a decades-old model with more replacement parts than originals, had tapped out halfway through the drive to Surrey. The town where Helen's new apartment was waiting was still two hours away. She was on a long, derelict road flanked by tangles of sickly shrubs and dry weeds. She hadn't seen another car since leaving her own vehicle more than an hour before and there was still no sign of the next town. The dirt road crested a few kilometers ahead, and Helen prayed she would top the gentle hill and find a sprawling town on the other side, preferably one with a payphone and a car repair station that catered to customers who were borderline broke. The insects hidden in the reeds that poked through swampy land sent up a shrill chatter. A long way away, a bird of prey screeched. Helen shifted her bottle of water to her left hand and rubbed her sweaty right palm on her jeans. She'd kept her burden as light as possible. The bottle of water was vital for the long walk into town, and she'd tucked her wallet and car keys into her pocket. Everything else, including her dead cell phone and the eight large cardboard boxes full of possessions waiting to be unpacked in her new home, were still in the car. At least I had the forethought to change into walking shoes, Helen thought, as she scuffed her sneakers through the long, brown grass that crept onto the dirt road. A low hum made Helen turn. A ute was coming up behind her, sending clouds of gray dust up in its wake. For a moment, Helen entertained the idea of hitchhiking. It would save her a huge amount of time, no small amount of frustration, and probably a few blisters. But she dismissed the idea almost as soon as it came into her head. She'd heard more than enough stories about hitchhikers going missing, and their remains turning up months, or even years later. There'd even been a spat of disappearances around the area she was moving away from. Young women walking home from the train station and waiting for a bus late at night had vanished. The police were urgently seeking any information the public could provide, but the clues were so sparse that they were almost non-existent. Helen focused on watching her feet, hoping the owner of the ute wouldn't try to stop for her. As it drew closer, its engine's noise became clearer. The deep, grating rattle seemed both unhealthy and unnatural. Keep your head down. If you show no interest in him... Chances are he'll just pass you by. The wheels crunched on loose rocks as the vehicle drew up beside her and, to Helen's frustration, slowed to a crawl. Found a problem, miss? A man asked. Cancer. That's exactly how Uncle Jerry sounded when he had throat cancer. She made herself look at the vehicle. It was old almost as old as her own ill-fated car, except where she'd taken care to keep hers clean and well-maintained. The stranger hadn't. Trash littered the front carriage, crumpled cigarette packages, empty brown bottles, plastic bags, wadded receipts that were so discolored Helen thought they must have been sitting there for years, and a used band-aid that had been casually discarded on top of the dashboard. The man behind the wheel matched his car perfectly. Helen guessed him to be around 50, but he looked much older. Greasy, steel-gray hair hung too long over his wrinkled forehead, 
and three days' worth of stubble covered his sunken cheeks. He looked sick. The sort of sick from cancer that progressed too far to be treated. His skin seemed thin, like cray paper, and his fingernails were long and stained yellow from nicotine. As he turned to face her properly, Helen felt a pang of shock. His left eye was an intense sky blue, although age and illness had sent red veins and a yellow tinge over the whites. His right eye, however, was opaque. A bump and a slightly darker circle where his iris had once been pointed at an odd angle compared to the other eye, as though it were blindly staring at a space far past Helen's left shoulder. I'm fine, Helen said bluntly, averting her eyes. Instead of stopping, she increased her speed as she moved off the dirt road and began marching through the underbrush. You sure about that? The man slurred. Pretty woman like you shouldn't be walking this road alone. Helen didn't answer. Her heart was thundering and her stomach was cold and tight. Leave me alone. Can't you see I don't want to talk? Just keep driving. She was drawing ahead of him, so the man tapped his accelerator to push his ute forward, sending black smoke from the exhaust. Motion just above the dashboard attracted Helen's attention. A trinket hung on the rearview mirror, danced around. At first she thought it was a strange, furry fruit. And then it rotated on its cord. And Helen caught sight of a nose. Two eyelids sutured closed, and a mouth distorted into a bizarre grimace. What the hell? He has a shrunken head. A shrunken head in his car. Is this real? She spared a second glance at the tanned, stitched-up skin, then looked away again as nausea rose in her throat. It looks real. This isn't a good road. The man licked his dry lips. His good eye was skimming Helen's body, while the blind eye stared intently at the sky. I'm fine, Helen repeated, and her voice sounded very strange and weak in her own ears. She was all but running, but the man in his ute kept abreast of her easily. He was grinning at her, and Helen saw that although he still had the majority of his teeth, many of them were rotting. A thousand scenarios ran through Helen's mind. Keep off the road so he can't run you over. Use your keys as a weapon. He's old. You could probably beat him in a fist fight if it came to that. Then the man said the one thing Helen had been dreading. Lots of people go missing on this road, you know. Heart and throat, bottle of water sloshing in her sweaty hand, Helen started running. The use engine revved as it lurched forward to match her pace. The man was saying something to her, but she couldn't hear him over the engine. Don't turn around. Don't slow down. Don't look at him. Something hard was digging into Helen's stomach. She rolled backward, trying to escape it, and dry, prickly weeds scratched at her face. She opened her eyes to see the sky filled with dirty twilight. With a groan, Helen sat up. Her back arms and legs ached, almost as though she'd been run over. She pressed her palm to her swimming head, waiting for it to clear. What happened? Did he... Suddenly panicked, Helen did a quick mental inventory. Her jeans were still buttoned, and while her back ached and her limbs felt bruised, nothing hurt where it wasn't supposed to. She let her breath out and pushed her loose hair out of her face. What happened then? She was sitting on the edge of the dirt road in almost the same spot she'd been before she blacked out. The gnarled tree to her left looked familiar. The twilight didn't seem to have deepened much either. Shapes melted together and played tricks on her eyes. Insects were chattering in the woods beside her and a bird of prey cried out in the distance. The ute and its repulsive occupant were nowhere to be seen. Get into town find somewhere with a lot of people. You can worry about everyone else once you're somewhere safe. 
Helen's legs felt unsteady as she pushed herself to her feet. She stretched, felt the bruises along her arm flare, then started walking. When her sneaker hit something solid, she looked down, surprised to see the bottle of water laying barely a foot from where she'd been left. She picked it up, then remembered about her wallet and keys. Both were still in her pocket. If he didn't assault me or rob me, what exactly did he do? Helen unscrewed the bottle of water and took a deep drink. Then she started walking again, suddenly wanting to reach the town more than she'd wanted anything in her life. Maybe I'll splurge on a hotel room and wait until morning before continuing the drive. Then, she heard the rumble of another approaching car. The reaction was immediate. Her heart rate rose, and a sheen of sweat covered her body as her adrenaline prepared her to respond to the threat. Relax. It's just a car. Not every human on this planet is dangerous. Keep your head down, and it'll pass you by. She couldn't stop her reaction to the noise, though. Fear clotted in her chest and left a metallic taste in her mouth as she increased her pace to a jog. The roar of the engine felt familiar. It had a rattle and unnatural cadence, similar to the man's ute. Almost exactly the same. Helen glanced over her shoulder, and the fear, previously just a whisper in her ear, commandeered her body. The ute, its dashboard littered with long, empty cigarette cases and beer bottles, was gaining on her quickly. Its shrunken head bobbed and danced on the string as the owner's sallow, diseased face watched Helen. The bottle of water fell from Helen's hand. She was running, dragging in terrified breaths, squeezing her eyes shut against the image. She prayed she was going crazy, and it was all in her mind. He's come back for me. Come back to finish the job. He'll skin me, probably. Turn my face into a shrunken head so I can bob along beside his other trinket for the rest of eternity. I found a problem, miss. The man crowed at her as the ute's engine roared. This time, the rock was digging into her back. Helen gasped, feeling disoriented as she rolled onto her hands and knees. The dizziness had returned, and the bruises on her limbs made her shudder. She lurched into a sitting position and waited for the ache in her chest to clear. He came back for me. Why? What for? Did he run me over with his ute? It would explain why everything hurts. But it didn't explain why she was still alive. If she'd really been hit by the ute going at that speed, she would have broken bones and serious internal damage at the very least. Helen rubbed her hair out of her eyes and looked around. She was still on the same stretch of road, with the same twisted black tree sticking out of the reeds to her left. The insects were humming above her. A bird of prey gave a loud cry. This feels so familiar. Like deja vu. Helen scanned the ground and saw the bottle of water laying there, waiting for her. She picked it up and swirled it around, confused by what she saw. It was half full. Didn't I drink most of it earlier? She looked at the sky. It was still twilight, hovering in that indefinite time that never lasted more than a handful of minutes. Don't go there, Helen told herself, as she unscrewed the bottle of water and took a drink. Don't you dare start thinking about time travel. But what if? The other, more adventurous half of her mind asked. Don't start asking what ifs. The last thing we want is to see that damn ute again. She glanced to the right, where the empty road behind her stretched into the distance. She let her breath out in a sigh and massaged her left shoulder, 
where the bruised muscles were tight. Something very strange has happened. But you can worry about that after you reach the town. What's important is that you're alive. You've still got all your limbs attached. And the ute is nowhere to be seen. She'd barely gotten to her feet when she heard the rumble of an engine behind her. Dread. Icy, cold, and uncomfortably familiar filled her chest as she turned around. The ute was topping the ridge down the road. It was still too far away to see clearly, but she was sure it was the same dirty vehicle. Helen licked her lips, which suddenly seemed very dry. Should I run? Hide? Running hadn't helped her before. After two encounters with the ute, she was reluctant to turn her back on it again. The vehicle was gradually gaining on her, kicking up black dust behind it as it roared down the road. Helen stood her ground, shivering and sweating, as stress built in a tight ball inside her. She felt as though she might be sick. Don't run. Don't let him out of your sight. Helen carefully pulled her key ring out of her back pocket and gripped it in her fist so that the key stuck out between her fingers like tiny blunt blades. The ute had come close enough for her to see its occupant. The grizzled man's face split into a rotten tooth smile as he met her gaze. The shrunken head bobbed like a Christmas bauble below the mirror. He slowed down as he drew closer and eventually came to a halt right beside her. Helen was close enough to smell the ute, which stank of beer, cigarette smoke, and urine. Found a problem, miss, the man asked for the third time that day. I don't know, Helen said, choosing her words carefully. Her hand holding her keys was hidden behind her back and her muscles were tense as she prepared to lunge an attack at a second's notice if the man made a move toward her. Pretty woman like you shouldn't be walking this road alone. He tilted his head back to scratch at his stubble with yellowed nails. His good eye roved over her as though assessing her for the first time, while his blind eye watched the slowly rotating shrunken head. Helen hesitated. She wasn't sure if she should tell him about her broken car, but she guessed he must have passed it and would have put two and two together already. This isn't a good road, the man continued when Helen didn't speak. Lots of people go missing around here. Why? Helen asked, surprised by her own boldness. Her nerves had been charged with electricity, and she shifted from foot to foot, intensely uncomfortable but determined not to show her fear. The man regarded her for a moment, head cocked to one side, dry lips pursed. Then he said... You're not long left Carlton's border. If you continue up the road a little way, you'll be in Mellow Key. But here, this little patch of road, is Harab land. You heard of Harab before, miss? No. Helen couldn't guess where he was going. The twilight was gradually fading into true night, and the insects behind her had quieted. Not many people have. The man scratched at his grizzled chin again. Sept, of course, for the souls who live there. I suppose most folks want to forget it exists. Strange things happen in Harab. Things that might give you and me some trouble sleeping at night. If you find yourself in Harab County, you're best if you move on as quick as you can. Helen shook her head slowly, indicating that she didn't understand what he was implying. The man reached forward digging through the litter on the passenger seat. And Helen, reflexively, took a half step back. He was only searching for a cigarette box, though. And when he found one that wasn't empty, he pulled out one of the rolls and clamped it between his cracked lips. A more immediate concern for you, at least, is the sinkholes. He cupped one hand around the cigarette as he lit it, then took a long drag and blew the smoke out of the open windows. It occurred to Helen that the shrunken head 
might not have been that brown when the man had bought it. Lots of sinkholes around here. They're hard to see in the day, and even harder at night. You'll want to be careful. Okay? Helen shifted uneasily and glanced at the road to her left, where she could still see the lip of the ridge, silhouetted in the fading light. How far is the next town? Uh, it'd have to be, what, twenty minutes' drive? Another puff of smoke. Then he raised his eyebrows at her. Want a lift? No, but thank you for offering. Again, his single working eye roved over her, assessing her dirty sneakers, jeans, light cardigan, and near empty bottle of water. You sure about that? It'll be a bit of a hike for a little lady like you. I'm sure. Helen put as much force into her voice as she could and managed to flash a tight smile. Completely sure. Suit yourself. He moved the cigarette to the other side of his mouth and turned back to the steering wheel. Watch out for those sinkholes now. They're hard to see. I will. The sound of the youth's revving engine grated at Helen's nerves, and the vehicle picked up speed as it followed the road toward the ridge. Helen watched it until it disappeared. Then she let her breath out and sagged. She wasn't dead, kidnapped, skinned, or any other kind of terrible possibility she'd been preparing for. If the man had been telling the truth, the town would still be a few hours' walk away. But that was bearable. Helen drained her bottle, then screwed its cap back on, and began following the road. The sounds had changed. With the end of daylight and the emergence of a smattering of weak stars, new insects had started a shrill song. An owl called from behind her, and one of its companions to her right answered. Helen had to slow her pace and focus on where she was walking to make sure she didn't step on a loose stone and twist her ankle. There was a strange, dark patch in the ground ahead of her, mingling with the weeds and pressing against the side of the road. It looked like a shadow, but there was nothing to cast it. Helen had to crouch down in front of it before she recognized what it was. A hole. Plants and vines grew so heavily around its edge that it was almost perfectly camouflaged in the bad light. It was at least two meters wide, and three meters long. Helen leaned over its edge to see how far down it went, but she couldn't see for more than a few feet. Watch out for those sinkholes now. The water bottle was empty and would have been just useless luggage for the rest of her walk. Helen dropped it into the hole and listened to the hollow tap as it hit the sides again and again and again before fading from her hearing. Damn, Helen muttered, sitting back on her haunches. The old man had been right. Sinkholes like this were a hazard for anyone walking in the roads in poor light, or anyone who wasn't paying attention to the road, for that matter. Helen glanced behind herself to the spot where the ute had pulled alongside her. She had been running in this direction, keeping off the road so that the ute couldn't easily hit her. It was a miracle she hadn't fallen into the sinkhole. Suddenly uneasy, Helen stood up. She had barely a second to realize the ground was shifting under her feet, collapsing, as led she hadn't realized she was standing on crumbled. And then... The rock was poking into her shoulder. Helen groaned. Her whole body ached as though she'd been hit by a truck or fallen down a very steep incline. She sat up slowly, waiting for the dizziness to pass. The light was fading as twilight converted day into night. To her left was the grizzled tree poking out of the marshes. Helen put her hand out to where she already knew the bottle would be and picked it up, feeling the water slosh inside it. 
This can't be happening. She sat where she was for a long time, waiting for the aches to ease as she listened to the hiss of insects and the birds of prey's single call. When she saw the ute tap the ridge farther down the road, she carefully got to her feet, brushing her hands over her jeans to clean off the worst of the dust. The ute pulled up beside her, and its haggard occupant focused his one good eye on her. Found a problem, miss? Helen hesitated only for a second before answering, Yes, actually. Can I get a ride into town? He gazed at her for a moment, taking her measure, before saying, Sure thing. Hop in. She opened the door and waited for him to scoop the litter off the passenger seat. The shrunken head rotated slowly until its stitched closed eyes were facing Helen. Then it continued to turn to survey the road. Helen climbed into the ute and pulled on her seatbelt. Where are you heading to? Town, Helen said simply, watching as the twilight gradually eased the landscape into darkness. Her half-full water bottle clasped in her lap with both hands. As quickly as you can, please. Sure thing, miss. The man pressed down on the accelerator, and the vehicle ground forward, its engine's noise rattling at Helen's nerves. Best to move through this part of the country as quickly as you can, anyhow. And now, a word from our sponsors. Spooktober 2022 is proudly sponsored by Press Start Productions' favorite, Venitas. Venitas has made this spooky season a little less scary with their quality gaming equipment and their ghoulishly good customer service. You won't be haunted with issues as the Venitas staff is always available to help with their expert and kind assistance. Even the undead can stand behind. If you're looking to upgrade your setup and want to do it in an affordable way, then look no further. As an added bonus, Venitas is offering all members of the Press Start family an additional 10% off all of their orders when you use code PRESSSTARTMOM at checkout. So, don't be afraid. Go to Venitas.com today. You know you want to. <laughs> 